check check okay can you all hear me uh, karen and nina good morning and welcome to class karen nina can you hear me okay thank you okay let's begin with the word of prayer uh, can i ask uh, sean can you please come and lead us in prayer please can get that mic come here okay sean is from uh, bangalore city and oh, it's okay you can't see him come little moon front sean please no, no, all <laughs> okay okay sean go ahead and read heavenly father thank you very much for gathering us all here today heavenly father be blessed and guide us and lead us mighty towards maths class heavenly father Please help us understand your word through Mammy, Father. Please help us understand this new book that we're reading today, Heavenly Father. Please lead us mightily to this book, to this uh, class, Heavenly Father. And thank you once again for gathering us all here today, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sean. Okay, today we'll begin um, uh, looking at uh, this book, The Code of Honor. So, if you can, you know, access it on our. Uh, website www.acwo.org uh, I've also posted it on the stream page so you can uh, access it, students, on the online students. Uh, it's available on the st stream page, the PDF copy of uh, this book, Code of Honor, so you can access it from the stream page. Okay, I've uh, put that on the stream page just now. So Karen, Nina, and uh, Krisha, you can access the book on the stream page, the PDF copy is there. Or you could even go to our website, www.apcwo.org, and you can go to uh, the books, English books, and uh, you can access this book, uh, Code of Honor, from there. Okay. Okay, so we are going to look at this book, Code of Honor. It's uh, basically written for um, pastors, okay, and for those in full-time ministry. So you must be wondering, you know, why are we looking at uh, or studying this book? Uh, some of you already are part of ministry and you just come to be trained. Some of you in the online class, the e-learning class are also uh, doing ministry um, alongside being with, uh, you know, joining this Bible college course. So this can be helpful. Uh, but, you know, those of you who are not already in ministry, you are going to be stepping into ministry in a year's time or two years time or three years time. And so some of the principles that we are going to learn from here is going to be very, very uh, helpful. You can even apply it now because, uh, you know, uh, we are all in full-time ministry always, right? Whether we are in the field, uh, you know, doing, engaging in ministry, uh, there's no like full-time or part-time ministry. We are all full-time believers. There's no part-time believers. The same way we're all in full-time ministry. So all of you are engaging in the week also. You're doing some uh, ministry on Sundays. You're also uh, doing ministry, whether it's set up or pack up or uh, welcoming people. It's all a ministry, okay? So some of the, uh, most of these lessons here uh, in this book uh, can help you, can also give you insights for your future to correct yourselves, to guide you and to realign you to what, uh, how God wants us to live in our Christian um, like so don't think okay i'm not in ministry and i'm going to be later on so i'll read this book later on i'll switch off now please don't do that okay this can also help us in our practical everyday uh, living as well okay so we look at uh, chapter one which is talking about our personal life okay um you know when we accept jesus christ as our lord and savior the the few initial days of our life we are very excited uh we are uh, you know, uh, we're reading God's word, we're praying, we're going for fellowships, we are, you know, just worshiping God. But 
as we journey into you know our life with God, into our spiritual life with God, uh, we become slack in this area of reading God's word and praying, right? Or even if we are engaged in ministry, we can become such busy bodies, um, or you know sometimes you're finding it difficult to handle. Uh, work, you're finding it difficult to handle ministry, you're finding it uh, difficult to handle, you know, as, uh, your family as well, and also get time to spend time with uh, God. So some of you might be in this whole um, framework where you are working, but also uh, doing some ministry. Uh, you're also, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 you know, got yourself into this online course or you're studying in the Bible college uh, and you also have a family to take care of. And so you don't find time to spend with God. And most of the time we kind of put our time with God in the uh, last of our list, right? To do the things that we need to do, uh, to do our to-do list in the day or the week. You know, uh, spending time with God is something that uh, we always put in the last only if we have some time, we manage to uh, read God's word. Just a few verses, just say a quick prayer, uh, just as a uh, ritual. But it's important that, you know, we spend time with God. Because uh, why is it important? Because our ministry is usually an overflow of what God is doing personally in us in our quiet time with God. Okay? So our ministry is an overflow of our relationship, our intimacy that we have with God. So the time that we spend with God, you know, um, we receive the anointing, we receive the power, uh, and that is seen flowing out through us even as we go to ministry. And a good example is Jesus himself, right? Even though Jesus was very busy ministering to so many people, uh, he would wake up very early or he would spend the whole night just you know, uh, uh, communing with his father, speaking, fellowshipping with his father. And we see the next day he goes about, you know, doing powerful uh, signs, miracles and wonders. Where is all that coming? Where that power is coming from? It was not because he was, you know, uh, I mean, he laid aside all of his um, deity. He took upon himself uh, and he was 100% man. But where did he get all of this anointing and power? It's, of course, the power of the Holy Spirit that is working in us. We have the same power of the Holy Spirit, but why aren't we able to do what Jesus did? Is because Jesus spent that time with the Father. Okay, so our ministry is basically an overflow of our relationship or our intimacy with God. So if you're not spending uh, quality time with God, then we can see, we can go and preach, but you know, none of them would uh, accept Jesus or the message will just be a good message, a feel-good message, but it will not transform lives of people, lives will not be transformed, lives will not be reached out to, and also, you know, we won't be able to see mighty signs, miracles, and wonders. So, so important uh, is our time with God. And sometimes we compromise that on uh, for other things, okay? And no one can help us to you know, journey in our personal relationship, in our personal walk with God. We need to take that steps, right? Nobody can push you. Uh, hey, did you? I, I, we don't ask you every morning. Hey, did you read your Bible? Did you pray? I, I'm sure uh, Dina or uh, Kiran is not asking you, or you know, online students, your parents or your spouse is not asking you. It's uh, something that we need to take. Uh, hold of. We need to take responsibility. It's something we need to be personally accountable to God for. Okay. So the next thing that we need to do is uh, schedule a time where you meet secretly uh, with God. A secret place, a secret time. Schedule a secret place, a secret time where you're going to decide, okay, this part of the day, I'm going to spend time, you know, uh, worshiping God, reading my Bible and praying. Uh, some of us are night birds, you know, like owls. We are bright in the night, you know, uh, and we are very dull in the mornings, okay, like me. I'm very bright in the night, but morning time is a little dull for me. Um, I think my my senses and my mind really activates at 4 or 5 in the evening, okay. Uh, it might be some like that for you also. So you might choose that time of the day to, you know, spend time with the Lord. Some of you are morning birds, you know, early morning birds where you wake up very early, you're fresh and bright, and that's a good time to spend with the Lord. So whichever time is the best time for you, give the best time to spend with the 
thought. But the best time is in the morning, you know, when it's, everything is very quiet. You've not begun your day. You don't have anything, you know. Usually in the evenings, we're thinking, okay, this happened, that happened. When we're praying or we're very tired, we fall off to sleep while we are praying or reading God's word. It just goes above our head. So, you know, you have to choose a, a secret place, a secret time when you are going to meet with the um, Lord. Okay. And it, let it be a consistent practice. Okay. Make that time consistent. Okay, so you know that, you know, this is the time I need to spend with the Lord. You don't keep anything, uh, or you don't take on any responsibility at that uh, time. Okay, uh, and we also see that, um, you know, when we spend time in the secret place, uh, God sees that he's uh, ministering to us and he rewards us publicly. So when we go out in the public, we're ministering to people, not only on uh, when we're invited to preach or teach or, uh, you know, we're up on the stage or on the pulpit. Uh, also, we're carrying this uh, our time with God, you know, in our hearts throughout the day. So, you know, even as you meet different people, God can give you a word of wisdom, knowledge, prophecy. You can speak into people's life. You know, when, when somebody's looking down, you can say, hey, why are you looking down? He says, you know, I'm not well. You say, okay, I'll, I'll pray for you. But instead of saying, I'll pray for you, you say, can I pray for you now? You know, whether it's in the shop, in the restaurant, in the, in the street, you know, we can just lay hands on them and believe uh, God to do signs, miracles, and wonders. So, you know, as the secret time that we... Uh, spend with God actually is carried out throughout our uh, day. It's a it's a day long communion with God, and uh, you know we are passing on to God the anointing and the power that we receive, just like Jesus, right? The time we spend with the Father in the night or the early in the morning, we see Him you know, reaching out to different people, just ministering to different people throughout the day, and we see Him mightily flowing in all the nine gifts of the. Um, spirit and you know we we shouldn't just uh, be content with yesterday's or you know the previous season the time that we spent with god sometimes you know we reach a point where we say you know i'm i, I speak in tongues i pray well i can understand the bible you know um, uh, i'm also receiving revelations from god and we can live in that past glory so to say the past revelations and uh, we seem to be content with that but you know what happens when water gets stagnated in a place, what happens? You know, when, when you pour water in a place and you don't, it just remains like that for a week or a month, what happens? Yeah, flies will come, mosquitoes will breed, it will be dirty water, it will it'll stink. The same thing in our lives. You know, you think yesterday's anointing, yesterday's power or the, you know, um, a few months back, you're strong in the Lord, you're spending time in prayer, you, you pray in tongues, you you were also seeing yourself flow mightily in, in science, miracles and wonders, the gifts of the Spirit you see have activated in your life. You can stay in that past. But, you know, it's very dangerous to stay in the past. You know, every day we need a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. And that's why we read in Acts, even though the disciples and the apostles were, um, you know, they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, they received power on the day of Pentecost. But if you read the book of Acts, we see, you know, every day we see they were, you know, um, uh, they were anointed with the Holy Spirit. You know, so we need that anointing every day. So even you can pray, even as you begin your day, you can say, God, anoint me afresh with your Holy Spirit. You know, a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. And we need a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit um, every day. So we need to stay hungry for God. Uh, we need to be more hungry for his word, for his spirit in our lives. And uh, this will make motivate us, you know, to spend more time with God. Sometimes we're more hungry for power. We're more hungry to flow in the gifts of the Spirit, but all of that comes as an outflow of our time with God. Okay, you cannot flow in the gifts of the Spirit. You cannot see the fruit of the Spirit manifested in your life if you are not spending time with the Lord. That is, you know, that's why Jesus says, "If you abide in the vine, you will, you will bear fruit." Okay, so this it's automatic. If you're connected to the vine. Okay, you're receiving the life from the vine. Automatically, you will, you know, you will reveal the fruit of the spirit and the gifts of the spirit. Okay, and we also need to continuously strengthen our character. What is your character? Character is basically who you are. Okay, it's not what you assume to be in front of others. We can show ourselves to be something else in front of others. Or it's not what people assume you to be because you are trying to show them something else about yourself. But your character is actually who you are in the 
dark, when nobody is watching you, in the secret place, on your bed, in your room, when nobody is watching you, what are you thinking? What are you, um, you know, watching? Uh, what are your thoughts? So character is who you are in your the secret choices that you make, the choices that you make, and in your own quiet own space. Okay, so it's very important that um, you know we build on our character. Our character is our moral uh, fiber. Our character is uh, it's the level of godliness that we walk in uh, in the private when no one is watching. Okay, so it is uh, the level of godliness that you are walking in. So if you're a god person even in a secret place when nobody's watching you you know what you're seeing on your mobile phones what you're watching on the tv what you're thinking in your mind you know there will be if uh, there will be a sense of godliness you will fear god because you know that god is watching over you so that is your character your character who's who you are in the dark in the uh, secret uh, place so you know we need to um, like in First Timothy chapter four, verse seven, it says, "You know, we need to exercise in godliness." Okay, we need to exercise in uh, godliness. Sometimes, you know, we think we are already godly people, so we don't need to. We don't read our Bibles. We don't pray. Uh, we become so busy. Uh, we live in yesterday's anointing or the previous season's anointing, but that can be very, very um, dangerous. Okay, uh, why can it be dangerous? Because it weakens us. Now, if you don't use one of your hand for just say one month or two months, what will happen to your hand? Yeah, your muscles will become weak, right? You have to use and exercise, okay? Otherwise, your muscles will become weak. In the same way, if you don't exercise your godliness, which means if you don't spend time with God in prayer, in worship, in reading God's word, then you see that, you know, um, Sin can easily creep in, temptation can easily creep in, and that's when, you know, uh, our character also will get affected. And we see that in our character, we will be making the wrong choices, sinful um, choices. And our character is not, uh, you know, uh, you know, developed. Uh, in a moment where we, you know, when we are in a in a difficult situation or in a problematic situation, or we are facing temptation, we make the right choice. That is not when our character is developed. Our character is developed throughout time. Now you look at Joseph's life, right? Uh, in Joseph's life, it says that you know, jo uh, that Potiphar's wife every day she would tempt Joseph, okay? and every day she would he would put off her temptation and uh, her advances against him okay but the time when nobody was in the house and she really pulls him okay uh, we see that you know uh, joseph was still very strong he does not give in okay he just flees he just runs he says how can i do this wicked thing against my master because he's not um, you know he's kept me away from you because you know uh, even though he's made me a manager but you are his wife and he says how can i sin uh, against God. Now, how do you think David was? Uh, sorry, Joseph was able to make this, um, you know, uh, right choices when he was facing these temptations. It's not that he developed his character at that moment. It was because he already had a strong character, a strong moral fiber of what is right and wrong, of doing what is right and not doing what is wrong. And that is what, how do we know that? It doesn't say in the Bible, but we see that, you know, his brothers, one of the reasons why his brothers hated him was they uh, Joseph would go and see what they're doing in the field. They would not be taking care of the sheep. They would be playing the fool. They would be sleeping. He would come and report back to his father because he knew what his brothers were doing was wrong. So you see his, his character was developed from a very, very young age. Okay. We see that even in the life of uh, Daniel. Okay, so character is developed over time. And how is our character developed? Our character is developed through our obedience to God, to his word. It's also through spending time with God. Um, and, you know, our character can never rise above our level of obedience to God. You know, if you're not obeying God, that means your character is not uh, in the right level where it has to be or in the right path where it is uh, to be and be sure that you'll be easily led into sin but if you are obeying god even in the small things of life even when you have you, you know you want to get out of a situation you decide hey i'm not going to lie 
Okay, your eye catches something which is unclean, but you immediately move. You know, you look somewhere else. You know, you have made an you have obeyed God. You know, you've treated uh, somebody has done something evil to you, has been rude to you, but you know, you are being nice to them. You know, you are living in obedience to. So it can be even in the simple things of life when we are living in obedience to God, it's where our character is developed. Okay, and our character will never rise beyond our level of obedience. So we need to keep a watch over our character. Nobody can keep a watch over our character. We need to keep our watch over our um, character. We need to grow uh, in the things of God. Also, we need to invite uh, the Word of God. Uh, to cleanse us, you know what uh, you know. Remember what uh, the psalmist says: uh, "Create in me a clean heart, O God, and restore a right spirit uh, within me." Okay, that should be our prayer. Be constantly looking at our hearts, our motives. Uh, you know, um, uh, invite the work of the work of God in our lives to His Word, the Holy Spirit, uh, to the influence of godly people. If some godly person somebody corrects you, your parents correct you, take that correction uh, and that will help you to rise to new uh, uh, strengths in your um, character. Okay. We also need to be uh, aware that, uh, you know, our enemy, he's prow he is always prowling around us like a roaring lion, looking at whom he can devour, eat, chew up, eat. Okay, so if you're not strong in, you're not keeping your time with God, you not maintain your consistent secret place, your time with God, uh, there's no level of godliness that you're reaching and also um, your character is not uh, being developed, it's not growing into levels of godliness, be sure that your enemy is there ready to um, attack you. Look at what Paul um, says in Philippians chapter 3 verse 12. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, Paul says, can somebody read that, please? For those of you who are following the textbook, it's on page number 12. Yes, yeah, so see, Paul has... Um, uh, you know, Paul has, you know, um, been such a great apostle. He has done such great things for God. But what does he say here? He says, I've not attained everything. See, and I've not become perfect. But he says, I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. Okay. So Krishna has a question here. Is it possible for people to be tempted and sin even after we are born again? Oh, yes. You know, it's a thousand percent yes. I think the devil attacks us more than he attacks the other person, uh, other people who are not born again because uh, he leaves them. Because anyway, he knows that, you know, they're all going to be destined to hell. But he tries to, uh, yes, he tries to uh, take us away from God. He tries to tempt us. And that is why it's so much more important, even if you're born again, you know, how much more time, whether you're a pastor, you're an apostle, you're a prophet, you spend 40 years walking with God in ministry. It's so important for us to read God's word, to be aligned to God's word, obey him, and to be always in tune with what the Holy Spirit is telling us and uh, correcting us. Okay. Uh, the next one is, we are on page number 12, do then teach. Okay. Can somebody read Matthew chapter 5 verse 19? Thank you. So what does Jesus say in um, Matthew chapter 5, verse 19? He says, whoever does and teaches them, they will, he, they will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Okay. So before we teach, we need to practice ourselves. We need to do it. Others, we don't teach or practice. So uh, there are some times, you know, when um, we are teaching, we have to teach about the gifts of the spirit because we want uh, the people we are ministering to in church or, you know, in a Bible study group, we want them to grow in the things of the spirit. Maybe we are not flowing in all the gifts of the spirit, but that does not mean that, you know, we don't go ahead and teach them about the gifts of the spirit. Uh, sometimes we might not be also manifesting all the fruits of the spirit. There might be some areas where we are asking God to work in our lives, it does not mean that, okay, I'll wait till I manifest all the nine fruit of the Spirit, then I will teach about it. No. 
you know, sometimes we can go ahead and teach the truths from God's word. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes you're going to, you're not married, uh, but you can still uh, preach and teach about um, family. I'm not married. I'm going to be teaching you the next lesson on family, about spouse and about children. I don't have, I'm not married myself. I don't have children, but we can still teach from God, the truth from God's word and let God, the truth from God's word uh, speak and minister to people. Sometimes we have failed in the past, you know, in certain areas of our life, you know, um, uh, but that does not, and we have, um, you know, we've asked God for forgiveness, we've aligned ourselves uh, back to God, you know, and then we can, you know, we, we feel in our heart that, yes, God has forgiven us, we've set that area right with God, we are uh, honoring God in that life, then we can go ahead and preach. Of course, people will mock us and laugh at us, but we know that, you know, we have set our uh, score right with God, we've aligned our life in that area back to God, and we can Go ahead. I remember a great man of God, um, you know, great pastor, uh, you know, reached out to many people, a great missionary himself. Uh, but he got, you know, uh, you know, he's been many years as a pastor, wonderful preacher, teacher. Everybody used to in Bangalore City used to look up to this great man of God, but he fell into temptation. So, Krishna, you know, um, this is also answering the question. He fell into temptation. Uh, he was caught in adultery. His wife came to know about it, had warned him, told him, but uh, you know he didn't heed the, his wife's um, what his wife said. And then finally, his wife had to you know reveal it to the organization because the sin cannot go on, right? And they caught him uh, with this woman. Uh, but then, you know, um, uh, he, he realized his mistake, he, you know, got back to God, he aligned himself back to God, asked God for forgiveness. And I remember one Sunday he preached in church and um, uh, he was talking about uh, marriage and family and he was also talking about adultery. When he came to adultery, he said, I know that, you know, what I have done in life, but I'm going to speak about it uh, because I know that I have set my life right with God. God has forgiven me. Um, and I know that I'm not walking that path again. Um, so don't think that I don't have the right to speak about it. I'm just going to speak from the truth of God's word, realizing that I've done a mistake, but, you know, I've been um, uh, forgiven by God and I'm just walking in obedience to what he has done um, and I have been of my sins. So sometimes we can even um, talk about our fa past failures and it just gives, uh, you know, room for people to see, okay, I'm going through this, but, you know, this man of God has gone through it he has come out, I can also come out, I need to um, come out, okay? Uh, so we need to practice God's word and then preach, but there are some times when we can just speak the truth from God's word, okay? The next point is be a voice, not an echo. You know, uh, all of us, we listen to other men and women of God, we receive from their revelations, we receive from their life, but when we receive uh, revelations and from their life and the move of God in their life, it doesn't mean that we immediately bring it and you know, copy it or imitate it in our, uh, you know, Bible study group that is meeting in our in our house or uh, our youth group that we are in charge of or uh, our, uh, you know, our church that we are overseeing. Uh, we just don't bring it and then we just don't, okay, this is what God wants us to do. No. But what we need to do is when we receive uh, revelations from other men and women of God and we also see the move of God in their lives, what we need to do is we need to, um, you know, uh, spend time, uh, let it become part of our lives first. And then at the right time, you know, when God's leading us, we reveal it uh, to people and then we let God uh, you know, work and move. Otherwise, if you just kind of copy and imitate things that is happening in this church, that church, you know, uh, we will just be an echo. You know what's an echo? You hear your own voice. Okay, there's, there's nothing happening. There'll be no life. You will see no power of God. We'll see no move of God. And we'll be wondering, hey, that man of God, you know, he did the same thing or that woman of God did the same thing in their church, in their ministry. And, uh, you know, I could just see the power of God, the move of God. Why is it not happening here? Okay, so it's very important to wait for the right time to see when God wants us to bring about it, uh, you know, and go ahead and do it. So God even desires to speak and instruct us. We've already learned that in depth when we looked at these two books, Fulfilling God's Purpose for Our Life and also receiving um, God's um, guidance. Okay, and where does God speak to us? He speaks to us in the secret place. 
you know in your personal time with god is times when god is going to reveal things not only give you fresh revelations also going to reveal things about your past uh, the next season what he wants you to do reveals the plans and the purposes for your um, life so when we receive revelations from god you know we need to personally walk in it and then you know when we see that work in our lives and then we preach and teach it that becomes very very powerful then it becomes a voice of god it becomes the voice of the holy spirit and not an echo okay the third thing that we need to do as uh, ministers of god or believers is to live a simple life you know just be yourself don't imitate others you know uh, don't pretend to be someone you are not just be yourself okay um uh, don't get entangled in the things of this world uh second timothy chapter 2 verse 4 paul is writing to timothy uh can somebody read that it's on page number 15 can somebody read and uh what does paul say writing to timothy second timothy chapter 2 verse 4 on page number 15 top of the page Yes, a soldier wants to please his commanding officer, does not get engaged in civilian affairs. And how does it relate to us? Uh, we've already looked at this verse before I've explained it. It really basically means that, you know, as believers, as born again believers, as ministers of God, who are we supposed to please? God, not people. Okay, God has given each one of us, he's designed us to be someone specific. Don't imitate, don't copy others just be yourself you know uh, and also don't pursue you know uh, a bigger house bigger car you know the latest gadgets lavish lifestyle but we're not saying this is all wrong this is not uh, this is sinful we're not saying that you know if your family is growing you need a bigger house then you can go ahead and get a bigger house you know if you want uh, you know a bigger car to accommodate more things or more people to drive them to church bring them back or you know you're carrying all of the church equipment with you you need a bigger car that's totally fine okay you need gadgets to enhance your ministry to get uh, you know uh, a laptop so that you can show powerpoints uh, you need a lcd projector you know you need a, a phone where you can access things well because you're you're somebody who's an itinerary minister you're traveling around you know it's okay those times you can buy a good uh, gadget but it's not that you know you need to pursue all of these things what you need to pursue in life is your intimacy with God, grow in the things of God, grow in the word of God, grow in uh, manifesting the fruit of the spirit and the gifts of the uh, spirit. Okay, don't get uh, caught up in showing people, okay, putting on a style, putting on an act, and all of that. You know, just live a simple lifestyle, be content with what God has blessed you with. Uh, Paul is writing to uh, Timothy in First Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 to 8. What does he say? Godliness. Anyone knows that? Uh, godliness with contentment is great gain. Okay. So if you're godly, it means you're spending time with God. You're content with what you have. Now, some of us are not content. We want more shoes, more clothes, more, uh, you know, the latest phone gadgets. We want this. We want that. You know, that is not being content. So godliness with contentment is great gain it's something that you gain yourself so don't pursue uh, accomplishing things of this world sometimes you know even when we're in a ministry you know sadly i've seen people in ministry they go from doing bth to bd to mth to phd they think in terms of the world okay they think in, in, in terms of the world uh they want to go abroad and minister they want to go to the us they want to go to the uk of course i'm not saying no you don't go anywhere but if god has specifically called you to go to these places then please go if god has called you to do an mth god has called you to do a phd please go ahead and uh, do it okay but just don't do it because you know in the world how do people live you know they think that uh even for doctors Everyone, every doctor says, you know, MBBS is not enough. Only if you do a master's, then you get more salary. You have, you know, you know, you have more avenues for you, uh, a job. Even if people are, you know, when they do PUC, 
QC is just not enough for you to get a job. You have to do a degree. Even degree is not enough. You have to get a master's, right? So, you know, the world is thinking like that. But when you come to ministry, sadly, I've seen many people uh, do that. And many of my classmates, they keep on asking me, hey, how come you've not done an MTH? You know, we thought when you were studying in Bible college, you will do an MTH, you'll even do a PhD. Um, some of them do an online uh, PhD and some of my friends have told me, hey, you know, you can just do this three months of PhD course. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, a far distance course, three months or six months and you get a doctorate degree. You'll have you'll be called as Dr. Selena Makwana. See, uh, just for a degree, you do six months or nine months. And then, you know, what's the difference between somebody who study? five, six years to get a PhD. What is the difference? Now, are we really into that rat race of the world and getting degrees and having names? You know, some of them say, call themselves as uh, Apostle Selena Makwana, Prophet Selena Makwana, or they put their name as, you know, pastor so-and-so, and they have all their degrees, uh, you know, lined up. I mean, we are thinking so much in the ways of the world. But actually, when you stand before God, he's not going to ask you whether you've been an apostle, prophet, teacher, you know, uh, how many degrees, whether you ministered in the U.S., U.K., which country, or whether you were in Orissa or in Chhattisgarh or, you know, in some backward place in, in India or in some unknown island in this world. But God is just going to see what you have, how obedient you have been to his call and how you have done his what he wanted to for you to do in his life if you pursued his plan and his will so don't get caught up in this rat race big church big congregation you know style this that you know just be simple who uh, how god has called you and it's uh, you know you can be simple but it's the point and power that of god that is going to be released through you that people are going to see you and identify you as a man or woman of god okay uh, so don't get caught up in the things of the world. Colossians chapter 3 verse 2 says, set your minds on things above and not on earthly things, not the things of the earth. Okay. So if you're not intellectual, don't pretend to be intellectual. Sometimes if you made a mistake, just say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Everybody is human, right? If you uh, don't know the answer for something, you know, being a pastor or being a teacher, it does not mean I, I know the answers for everything. I just say, okay, I'll look up or I'll check it up or, you know, I'll see. We can't guarantee an answer for everything. Okay. Uh, don't pretend to be rich when you're not. You know, just be simple who you are. Don't uh, always try to move with the intellectual people, the rich people, the elite people. Uh, don't associate with the low people. You know, we need to associate both with the rich, the lowly people, the humble people, the simple people. We need to learn to relate with everybody. Romans 12 verse 16, we are on page number 16. Romans 12 verse 16 says, what does it say? Yes, yeah, so what does it say here that, you know, be of the same mind towards one another, set your mind on things above, associate with the humble, do not be wise in your own opinion. Sometimes we think what we are saying is right, everybody else is wrong. That is wrong, okay? The next thing is we need to keep our hearts pure, guard our motives, Okay, um, you know, sometimes uh, in Christian, as born again believers, we think, you know, we are uh, we are uh, going the right path because we don't drink, we don't smoke, uh, we don't do drugs, you know, uh, we're not caught up in adultery and all of those things. But we need to be very careful because there are some internal sins that are more dangerous that can lead to these external sins, can be pride can be jealousy, can be hatred, can be selfish ambition, uh, all of these things which are internal, which are very subtle, you know, can lead us into more external uh, uh, sins, okay? So, you know, um, God is not interested in how much we do for him, but he's interested in why we are doing what we are doing. He's looking at our motives. Our motives is to seek glory, fame, and recognition. You know, we know that it's wrong motives, but, uh, you know, uh, we already looked at this verse. We are on page number 17. 
top of page number 17, John chapter 7, verse 18, uh, where it's we see that, you know, um, if the one who seeks glory for themselves, you know, and not the glory of the one who sent them, then, you know, there is no, uh, there is unrighteousness that is found in them. We already looked at this, okay? But if we are people who are not seeking our own glory, but we're seeking the glory of the one who sent us, then God's word says there is no unrighteousness in such a person, okay? And we also need to, you know, uh, take a hold of our thoughts. Uh, time and again, we need to look at our thoughts, examine our thoughts, you know, bring uh, our mind captive to God, every thought captive to God, see if there's lust. You know, sometimes all of these lustful thoughts can hide behind our whole uh, garb or our whole mask that we wear of holiness people will not be able to see it but who's able to see it god is able to um, see it and you know at times also when we get very angry with uh, you know when our bible study group members or our church members with the pastor of a church or our bible study group members when they go to other church meetings they attend other churches or um, they're listening to other pastors or they're reading other pastors books you know we get uh, we feel with we are angry we get uh, you know filled with envy jealousy um you know we become very insecure uh and then we tell those people no you shouldn't be going to that pastor's church because that pastor is he did this 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 he's like that you know uh, no we need to let people go and receive you know and if they belong to your family they're truly sons and daughters they belong to the family they will come back right for example all of you have left your family and come here Right? You're not going to stay here forever, even though you like all people's church. Okay, Even though you might like all people's church, Bible college, you're not going to stay here permanently and tell your family, you know, I like all people's church, I'm going to stay here in this Bible college hostel for the rest of my life. No, you will go back to your family. Even children, they might love their teacher more than they love their mother because they're just spending a lot of time with them. Their mother must be busy or might be a very strict person compared to the teacher who's loving. The child can't say, I'll stay in school the whole time. The child will go back home. So, you know, don't worry if your sheep is going elsewhere. If they belong to your family, they're truly sons and daughters, they will come back. Okay, don't stop them. Let them learn. Let them receive from others. You don't become insecure. Don't be afraid. Okay, don't be afraid of other ministers, the ministries, other leaders. Um, you know, if some minister or leaders, you know, rise above, your, above you, you know, you are a senior pastor in the city and there's a junior pastor who's flowing mightily in science, miracles and wonders, preaching mightily. You know, people are going to his church. Don't become insecure. See, don't say, hey, there's something happening there. He's doing this, 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 trying to find out something. Let people go. Let them receive, you know, because God is the same Holy Spirit working in him. You know, you also just be faithful in what God has entrusted to uh, you. Okay. Uh, so all of us as Christians, you know, believers, we struggle at uh, with this. Um, but our center point should be our relationship with God. That is where our life begins. That is where our life continues. That is where our ministry begins. And God is looking for purity in our um, hearts. Okay. Um, uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31. Can somebody read that? We are on page number 18. Yes. So Paul is saying you judge your own life. If you're not going to judge your own life, if you are not going to set your life right and secret sins that you're having, you're not going to bring it before God and let the word of God and the Holy Spirit correct you. You know, at, uh, uh, in the book of uh, Numbers, God says your sin will find you out. I think it's Numbers 22, 23 or Numbers 23, 32. You know, uh, in the book of Numbers, God says your sin will find you out. So if you're not, God is going to give you a chance. Okay, He's giving you chances to set yourself right. But if you're not, God is going to pull up that sin. And when it does, you know, there's going to be a lot of shame and um, disgrace. So, you know, we need to be true to ourselves. We need to judge ourselves, you know, where we are in our level of godliness, our character, our thoughts, whether our motives are um, 
pure and right and we need to invite the Holy Spirit we need to invite the Word of God to work in our lives just like um, the psalmist said in Psalms chapter 139 verses 23 and 24 search me O God and know my heart ask God to search your heart to show you point out even as he lays a finger on things that he wants you to set right in your life no, set it right. Ask God to cleanse you, purify you through his word and to the spirit. Uh, sometimes the cleansing happens quick. Sometimes you see the temptation keeps persisting. So what do you do at that time? Don't think the temptation is stronger than you. You need to spend more time in prayer, speak in tongues, pull out scripture verses that talk about the sins, meditate on it. And then, you know, sometimes the stronghold is so strong you need to, you know, advance against it very, very strongly for it to break. Some sins you can easily get over, but some sins you're not able to get over. Don't think, okay, you know, I'm not able to get over this. It's going to be part of my life. Uh, this temptation is stronger. No, no temptation is stronger because where is your enemy? Underneath your feet. Okay, you're above him. So you are already given victory. You're victorious. Okay, so you can read God's word, meditate on it and ask God to cleanse you and the Holy Spirit to work in your life. Don't kill your own conscience. What is our conscience? Our inner voice. Okay, uh, God speaks to us through our conscience. Sometimes what the Holy Spirit is saying and what our conscience is saying can be in alignment. When our mind is renewed, when our life is in alignment to God's will, our conscience is also aligned to God's will. And so sometimes our conscience can be in agreement with what the Holy Spirit uh, is saying. The Holy Spirit can impose uh, what he's speaking even to our conscience. Okay, so we need to maintain a pure and a clean conscience why because i have explained to you if our conscience is dead to some sin what happens sin can overtake our life we can give all theological reasoning arguments we can even show from god's word that's the extent we can go to from god's word saying that that i'm i mean i'm in this kind of adultery but you know it's what i'm doing is right we can try to prove it why? Because our conscience is dead. You know, when our conscience is dead to a sin, it's very, very dangerous because, you know, that time sin can take over our lives. And, you know, we don't even know what is right and wrong. We just keep doing what is uh, sinful. And that is what that is very, very uh, dangerous. So we need to keep a clean conscience at all times. And Paul warns us that we need to have faith along with a good conscience. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 19, he says we will spread our faith if we will have a good conscience. We need to have a good conscience also and have faith. Okay? Um, so faith and um, a good conscience go alongside each other. So keep listening to your conscience. Don't kill it. It's uh, a small part of you, but it makes a huge, big difference so sometimes you can see people just talking bad words just automatically coming out of their mouths even if they're not angry even if they're not fighting with somebody they can just be talking normal everyday things you've seen young people or you know middle-aged people they're just talking to their friends but you know they'll be they have so many bad words in that you say how can they even use those words it's because their conscience is so dead to using those words okay so we need to keep our conscience always alive and not let it die yes can you please take the mic and ask the question no, because the uh, students need to the students also can listen to you uh, you talk about do not become insecure uh, do not be insecure insecure of uh, other pastors so the thing is uh, what i observed in in our place in our places, some pastors attracting believers to come to the church. So there is a little bit of pain for the own shepherd, right? So There's a little bit? There is a little bit pain in the, in the heart of own shepherd, own pastor. So uh, what we can, how, how can we see that? 
okay yes i mean this is a common problem that's happening everywhere it's a good question you know uh, there are some preachers who want to attract the crowd so they'll attract crowd with their charisma their style uh, they're talking about prosperity gospel they don't talk about sin they don't talk about salvation they don't talk about uh, uh, you know eternal death and all those things they just want to attract uh, people to the to their churches and some people just you know, uh, go there. And, you know, the other pastors are kind of heartbroken. You know, I have invested in these people. They've gone. But you don't have to, you know, you've done your part in um, in feeding them as long as they're there in your house or in your, in your part of your family. If they step out, it's their own responsibility. You know, uh, uh, just pray for them that God will open their eyes and see the truth and they might come back to the church or go back and be part of a spiritual church where the truth of God's word is being uh, taught to them. That's what we can do. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We will stop here and we will come back after a break. Thank you, everyone.